back to verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength, spiritual strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. I'm on verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple, but Barnabas. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, uh, that's the Greek-speaking Jews that had the culture of the Greeks, against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Troas. So Jesus claimed to be the son of God. Initially, Saul persecuted Christians thinking he was doing the will of God. Uh, he looked at Jesus as an imposter. Saul, as a good devoted Pharisee, was still using that Pharisaical way of thinking to look at the Old Testament. And he was still looking for, a, I guess, a different type of Messiah, a different type of Jesus, you know, one to come and they were always looking for Jesus to uh, lead them against Rome and reestablish uh, Israel, you know, and do away with the Roman Empire. In other words, they were looking for that literal kingdom, weren't they? And I guess Paul, Paul was too. But on the road to Damascus, when that bright, brilliant light appeared to him, uh, Paul believed that that was Jesus when Jesus spoke to him. And now we see Paul... Uh, dramatically changed and then well he was a persecutor wasn't he uh, before I continue anything in this reading that jumped out at you that you want to comment on about Paul's life doesn't have to be about Paul's life before becoming a Christian and after but anything you might want to point out <coughs> Let's go through it a step at a time, and then maybe y'all can help me out as we do this, all right? In verse 20, there's that word, immediately. He proclaimed Jesus. Now, he was a persecutor, and now he's teaching Jesus. Uh, have you ever known anyone that became a Christian, and, and uh, before they were a Christian, uh, maybe they weren't persecuting Christians, but they, in no way, were they interested in uh, living for Christ. Maybe they even lived an immoral life. And then uh, very soon after that, with little knowledge, they're wanting to tell others about uh, becoming a Christian. I've known people like that. A lot of people initially, upon becoming a Christian, they want to tell everybody. You know, they tell several people. But then what happens a lot of, a lot of times? People aren't interested. Maybe one out of, I don't know how many, you find interested initially. Now, when we sow the seed, we don't know but what 20 years later it has an effect, you know. But for a new Christian, if you teach several people and uh, there's not much of a response or they don't seem to be interested, what happens to that new Christian if he's not encouraged by fellow Christians? They kind of you know, the light kind of goes dim, doesn't it? Uh, now, I can say that because 
I can't, I've really experienced that, you know, I, I wanted to tell my relatives and all my, I'd study with them and fairly quickly I got discouraged because not very many were interested. They just weren't interested, you know. Uh, some, some showed some interest and some are still studying. But uh, Paul immediately, it says, proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue. Uh, I think we talked about this last week, but there's no way I can imagine the turmoil. I forget somebody used that word last time in Paul's mind, realizing that he gave his approval to the murder of Christians. And now he's confronted with Christ and he becomes a Christian. We talked about Acts 22, 16, when Ananias told him, so uh, quit wasting time, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He became a Christian in the very same way as the people on Pentecost day in Acts chapter two became a Christian. Have y'all noticed that pattern as you're reading through Acts? It never changes. The church was established in Acts chapter 2. That's the original church. Uh, the original promised and prophesied church of the Old Testament. And God kept his word. Jesus in Matthew 16 said, I will build my church. And he talked to Peter and said, I'm giving you these keys, these symbolic keys to use. And you're going to use them. And Peter did and the other apostles when he preached on Pentecost. And that same pattern. You see it all the way through the book of Acts. You start in Acts 2 and they preach the word, the church is established. Uh, later you see others, Philip going to Samaria. He preached the word, the same word in the church, the Pentecost, the church that was established on Pentecost is established. Okay, so back to Acts uh, uh, chapter 9, verse 20. Immediately, Paul wasted no time in beginning his mission. Paul was not taught the gospel by any man, was he? How did he receive it? Galatians 1, 11, and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it yeah, through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He got it directly from Jesus. Now, this is important because the apostles on the day of Pentecost, you remember they were told, wait in Jerusalem till you are empowered with the Spirit. And they were. They were empowered on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And then when they were empowered, did they speak just whatever they wanted to speak? They were guided by the Spirit. Uh, they spoke in all these various languages and dialects of the people <coughs> as proof that what they were preaching was from God. Later, they performed miracles to confirm this word. They get it directly from Jesus. Uh, Paul gets that word directly from Jesus. Now, we're leading up to Acts chapter 15, where there's a big conference in Jerusalem with the apostles. And Paul goes there. Peter's there. Uh, James, one of the elders, is there. So when we get there, uh, we're going to see when they have their conversation and their uh, debate or discussion, so to speak, over uh, something that the Judaizers were teaching, meaning that the, some of the Jews that had become Christians were saying, well, yeah, having Christ is good, but they also need to be circumcised to be a follower of Christ. Well, Paul didn't teach that. Peter goes to Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. He didn't tell them they had to be circumcised. He preached the same gospel to Cornelius that Paul preached to other Gentiles later. And while I'm on that topic, uh, when you read through Acts up through about the first uh, 13, 12, 13 chapters, notice that connection. I, I made a little note here. Joel 2, Acts 2, Jews and Gentiles, Peter and Paul preached the word and they both preached to Gentiles and neither of them told the Gentiles you must be circumcised. So that's something that had to be worked out in the first century at the, at the early establishment of the church. 
So we see in Acts 2 the empowerment by the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. And Paul is directed by, by Christ also when he becomes an apostle. He says, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Synagogues. That's where the Jews meet. And he says in verse 20, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Why would Jesus go, not Jesus, Paul. Why would Paul go to the synagogues? That's the place of will. The place of will? That's, that's what he knew. You know, these masks make it hard for me, and I'm a little hard of hearing. Well, anyway. I think that's just, that's what he knew. Uh, that's what he knew. That's definitely a reason. He knew what, what those people were thinking. That's where the Jews met. What day? On the Sabbath, didn't it? Uh, primarily in the synagogues. Uh, who knew the law better than Paul? Who knew that pharisaical law, the, why the old law, uh, better than Paul? Not many. And he went to the synagogues because that's where the Jews were. He was a Jew and he proclaimed Christ to them. And notice it says, he is the Son of God. So he went to the synagogues, proclaimed Christ, saying he is the Son of God. And they didn't have the written New Testament. And when he proclaimed he is the Son of God, Paul would go to the Old Testament and go to the prophets and to the teachings in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, for example. That's how the Ethiopian eunuch heard about Christ. He's on the road reading Isaiah 53. So Paul goes to the synagogues. That's where the Jews are. And preaches, he is the son of God. Now Jesus claimed to be the son of God. And uh, the Jews, when Jesus was alive, accused him of blasphemy and uh, attempted to stone him to death. And back in John 10, 31 through 33, uh, they said, it's not for a good work that we are going to stone you. But for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Well, we know that's true. He is the Son of God. He proved it by the resurrection from the dead. Throughout Acts, that's one of the major themes, the resurrection from the dead. So he proved. Paul goes into the synagogues and from, from the, uh, the Old Testament, the Old Law. He proved that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed and said, you know, wouldn't you be startled and amazed? Here's a man that leaves Jerusalem, goes to Damascus uh, for the, his mission is to persecute Christians, those of the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he went there to persecute that way, those that followed Christ. And then... In a short time, he's saying, no, Jesus is the Son of God. That, that would get my attention if someone did that. Uh, starting in verse 1 again. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? Now let's talk about called upon this name in Jerusalem. What does that mean? Called upon this name. How did they do that in Jerusalem? Turn back to uh, Acts 2 with me. And I think it's verse 21. Then we'll go to verse 38. Verses between Acts 22. 20, or Acts, excuse me. Acts 2, 21. And then Acts 2, 38. So Acts 2. 21, I think. Yeah. And it shall come to pass, that's part of this prophecy of Joel, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, does that mean if I say, Lord, Lord, Satan? Is that all there is to it? Well, let's keep reading. Let's see what it means to call on the name of the Lord. We covered it in part last week when we looked at the conversion of Saul and we uh, went to Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, and in Acts 22, 16, again, where Saul was told, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
we know Paul is not in Christ. We know Paul has not had his sin forgiven until he was baptized. So here in Acts 2, 21, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the very next verse. Men of Israel, hear these words. Now take note as you read through uh, Acts, especially we're focusing on the first uh, uh, 12 chapters, 13 chapters or so right now. Hear these words. Cornelius was told that he needed to hear words. So when Peter goes to Cornelius, he's going to preach or teach Cornelius what he needs to do to become a Christian. Verse 23 of Acts 2. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands, crucified. And it says they put Jesus to death. But verse 24, whom God raised up. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, is preaching the resurrection of Christ. And right before that, he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now they're hearing the gospel proclaimed. Jesus is raised, and then go on down to verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, that's David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, on David's throne. This is the spiritual kingdom that God promised to institute. Uh, and all through the gospels, by the way, he promises this kingdom. Uh, and then verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up. There's strong emphasis on resurrection and Jesus being uh, crucified and raised. And in verse 33, he's exalted, that's glorified. He's exalted, Jesus is glorified. And this glorified, exalted Christ appeared to Saul on the Damascus road and in a bright light that was overwhelming, that blinded uh, Paul. He's at the right hand of God now. In verse 33, it says, And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. That's the inspiring of the Spirit uh, that uh, the apostles are preaching and teaching on the day of Pentecost. Now, verse 36 Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then 37. Now they heard this. They heard those words. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest <coughs> of the apostles, men and brethren, now, he could, they say men and brethren. Why would they say brethren? They're not Christians yet. But those were Jews on the day of Pentecost. They called each other brother. They considered each other brethren. What shall we do? Verse 38. Now, Peter answered. Now, keep your finger right there on Acts 2, 38. And for me, I've got to flip back a page to verse 31. And he quotes Joel. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, why am I spending quite a lot of time on this little phrase we just read in Acts 9? Because many in, in our religious world today do look at that call on the name of the Lord and say, just call on God to save you. They stop right there. And when they really need to read the rest of the uh, chapter 2, and they need to read other examples in the book of Acts because it's it's written there for us. It says, whoever calls, that includes obedience. That includes, includes hearing the word proclaimed as Peter proclaimed it, and as Paul will later proclaim it, as Philip and many others proclaimed it. They need to hear that word. And then in verse 38, Peter answered their question, and he's telling them how to call on the name of the Lord, just as Ananias did to Paul when he said, get up, be baptized. We, uh, it was obvious that Paul had repented. He was three days in prayer, three days in prayer and turmoil. I like that word that, that somebody used last time. There has to be turmoil in a person's life when they realize 
you know, how have I been living? I've been wrong. I need to be, uh, become a follower of Christ. So Acts 2, 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized or immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Arise and be baptized uh, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that, back to our text now, Acts 9, and that was in verse 21, Paul made havoc of those who called upon the name of the Lord. In other words, they had become disciples of Christ in Acts chapter 2 at that very first time. Uh, preaching of the gospel to establish the kingdom that Jesus promised uh, all throughout his teaching, but specifically in Matthew 16. Any comments here? Now, so uh, perhaps, you know, we're we've talked in this class about having a desire to teach others. Uh, if you remember, just to go back to Acts 2 and read the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, when you get to Acts 2.21, and it talks about calling on the name of the Lord, well, read further into that chapter, and it tells what those people did to respond to that gospel invitation. And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? They were puzzled. Here's this man that persecuted uh, Christians, and now he's uh, he's preaching Christ. Verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews, confused the Jews, who lived in Damascus by proving, proving that Jesus was the Christ. He's preaching resurrection, Paul is, just as Peter preached resurrection on the day of Pentecost, he's saying Jesus is the Son of God because he's been raised. He can certainly tell them about uh, that, what happened on the Damascus Road and how Jesus appeared to him in that bright light. Uh, look at all the proof. Uh, we, we look at Acts, it, it's history. When Peter wrote to Theophilus, that government official, we assume he was, a government official, they could go check this out, you know, going to these places and asking what happened. There are witnesses, many, many witnesses to ask about in that first century to ask about. Uh, it wasn't hidden from anybody. It was, uh, you know, people saw it that, that never even became Christians. They witnessed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we saw these things happen. We know that it happened. I'm wondering what would be so bright back in that day that we Lift your eyes, other than Yeah, I've had my eyes burn from a welder before, and I'm sure you do. That, that's a very bright light, a welder, and it it don't put scabs on your eyes. Right, I mean, yeah. it might be sore, that might be hurt, swelled up, or something so bright. Lifters your eyes for three days and put scales on. Uh, doesn't it say this somewhere that Jesus lives in light, unapproachable, something like that? And we know he's at the right hand of God. In Acts chapter 1, he was raised. He spoke to those uh, apostles and others before he ascended to the Father. And now he's at the right hand of God, and he approaches, like you said, with this bright, bright light, the Apostle Paul, and Paul could not deny it. And then when Paul, this was confirmed to Paul in more ways than one that Jesus was raised. At first, Paul was convinced, yes, that was Jesus that appeared to me. And then he received the word that he was to preach, uh, not from any man, but he received it directly from God. That's another proof to Paul and to us uh, that Jesus has been raised. So Paul got all kinds of proof that that was Jesus on that road. 
Saul increased in strength, in spiritual strength, and confounded the Jews. I marked a verse down here if I can find it. Third I, I John verse two. Third John verse two. Someone turn there and read that. He grew in strength, in spiritual strength, and there's a prayer there for us. Uh, have we to live our daily life? <coughs> a prayer for us. Third John two. If someone has it, dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. I, I like that little verse. And it's a reminder for me to grow spiritually. And it, it says, I hope that you are strong in body. We want good physical health. We don't always have it. But we want it. He says, I hope you are strong in body as you are in spirit. I think that's what it said. In, in spirit. In other words, grow spiritually. What's going to happen to this body someday? Well, it's going to deteriorate. But that uh, our spiritual growth, uh, it's, it just continues. You know, the body is going to decay, but you cannot waste time studying the Bible. We can waste a lot of time. Some of the things we do. And I don't consider it a waste of time to enjoy life and go to the lake. And, you know, those things are there. God created for for our enjoyment he created you know it's, it's good to work and make a living uh, but spend time growing spiritually uh, and studying God's word comments anyone verse 23 when many days had passed the Jews plotted to kill him look at this reversal he went there and Paul did to a arrest and persecute Christians. Now he's being persecuted and the very Jews that supported Paul are plotting to kill Paul. Verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, catch him going out the gate you know, and then kill him. But his disciples, that's Paul's disciples, what is a disciple? That's a key word I underline. A follower? A follower. A learner. And if you're a follower of someone, a learner, you learn what they're teaching with the idea that you rely on their authority. Well, whose authority was Paul relying on now? The word, the word of God, Jesus. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Now he's doing his best to evade the Jews that, that want to persecute him. And that's what uh, Christians were having to do when they saw Paul coming. Uh, but now they don't. Verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, the disciples of Christ in Jerusalem, the followers of well, the way. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. Now, it would take a little convincing for me. Uh, and it took Barnabas to help out here. Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, the other apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly. There's another key word. Preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Now back to that verse we looked at in 3 John verse 2 that we can grow spiritually as well as have good health in our body. Well, if we grow spiritually, now when we look at this word boldly, it doesn't mean with a hateful attitude, of course. It just means I have some confidence when you when you open the Bible and point the word to people. Just have confidence and boldly uh, tell others about Jesus. Verse 28, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly again in the name of the Lord. Comments? <laughs> I'm really skeptical of someone who was so against God and doing the one he needed being right there. I would, it'd be hard for me to listen to him. Yeah. 
you know, I, I can say I've been guilty of this. You're around people, you have friends, and you think, oh, they wouldn't be interested. But then you think about Paul. He did a 180. We called it, one of our classes was called a 180, a complete turnaround. So we, we should, if, if when that thought enters my mind, I immediately say, oh, yeah, he could be interested. He could be. Verse 29, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Now, back to this word synagogue, uh, Luke points out many times where Jesus was teaching in the synagogues. And then Paul, of course, makes it his habit to go to the synagogue because he can find Jews there. That when he starts his journey, his missionary journey, he'll go to the synagogue, preach Christ, and some are interested and some aren't. But he's never deterred from preaching and proclaiming Christ. Come on in. Good morning. Good morning. Just a fly on the wall. <laughs> Come on in. And what did he say? What did Paul say in Romans 1.16? Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. But notice uh, Paul's pattern. He goes to the synagogue, preaches Christ in the synagogue, and then he goes out. We haven't gotten there yet, but. Starting on his missionary journeys, Paul is going to go uh, to the Gentile then and proclaim this same word to the Gentiles. What was Paul's message? Jesus is what? The Son of God. And then, of course, he would preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Then verse 21 again of our context. What kind of reputation did Paul have? Did y'all have, if y'all are in that? We're still in chapter 9, verse 21. Well, they were a little bit afraid to associate with Paul. Paul earned this reputation. Galatians 1, 23, in regards to Paul's reputation. They, go ahead. I would, I would imagine they would think it's a trick. Because Paul, he's really been against the Christians, and now he's proclaiming them. I would, I would I'd be doubtful. <laughs> I'd be like, he's tr trying to trick us or something to expose us or I don't know. I think that's a good point. Uh, I think I would have thought that. I would have thought, who does this guy think he is? He, does he think we're going to fall for that? Right. You know? Be kind of like a Republican following Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's a trick, right? It's not. You <laughs> He's going to get us in trouble. <laughs> okay, that's a good, good thought. Bro. Jesus is the Son of God. They were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. I just read Galatians 1 23 in connection with Acts chapter 9. <laughs> I, now I know. Well, let me speak for myself. Uh, upon becoming a Christian, we don't forget our past. Sometimes our past sins still haunt us. We think, ah, oh, why did I ever live like that or do this or do that? Well, so our sins still haunt us. But in Christ, we are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So for a Christian, when you start thinking about things that you wish you had, had never done and things you cannot undo, well, do what Paul did. He said, I put that behind me. He knew, you know that it had to haunt him at times. He gave his approval to the stoning 
of a really good man, Stephen, back earlier in the book of Acts. And he did that to many of And it says men and women. You know, he gave his approval to the persecution. But he also says uh, that we are a new creation. That's God. That demonstrates God's love for us. He wants us to be, to live the right kind of life. And we can't do that without him and his word. Verse 22 again, we talked about that one and we read 2 John verse 2. Paul uh, increased in strength, in spiritual strength. He grew where he could preach and teach with boldness. Uh, by the way, I, I'm going to pause here because I meant to do it. Uh, I've got a little deal there. It's a timeline. But you know, we started in Acts 2. That's about 33 AD or so. And then when Paul, when that Book of Acts ends in, in chapter 28. It's about 63, 64 when Luke is writing. You know, I think that's about right. So we've got about a 30-year time frame here in the book of Acts. And if you're like me, sometimes you're reading through there. Luke doesn't bother to tell you. Now, this happened 10 years later. He, he might go uh, from one chapter to another or one verse to another, and it'd be a year or two. So when you're reading through it, you have that time this is happening over a period of several years because Paul went into Arabia, what was it, three years? And, he, you know, it took him time to grow. And then all of a sudden he's on, uh, uh, on his uh, campaign trail, so to speak. He's on his uh, missionary journeys to win people for, for Christ. Ephesians 6 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Grow spiritually. I, I've thought a lot about these verses. I, I think we tend to do that the older we get. Some of y'all are pretty young in here. But, you know, the older we get, you think, you know, this life, that's not all there is. There's something coming later. So I need to grow spiritually, lay up treasures in heaven because there's something now I'm not one that wishes or says I just soon go right now I don't you know I enjoy the beauty of the day I'd like to be here to live longer like a friend of mine used to say that passed away several years ago in his 90s he uh, somebody would say well are, are you ready to go over he said oh yeah I'm ready to go but not right now you know <laughs> I'd like to hang around a little longer but still we need to grow spiritually and be Already. Now he confused the Jews. You present the gospel to someone, and if they don't know the Bible, or if they uh, or have been taught wrong, if they're an atheist, or whatever the case might be, there's going to be some some confusing going on because you have to uh, meet them where they are, so to speak, and try to bring them around to examining the scriptures, and then uh, hopefully. Uh, following Christ. Uh, Colossians 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world and not according to Christ. So we are to be in the world but not of the world and that's a challenge because when you're in the world and not of the world uh, sometimes you you uh, maybe let your guard down and they kind of lead you in the wrong direction instead of you leading in the right direction. Day and night in verse 24, Acts 9, 24. Paul was relentless. Paul was relentless in his relentless in his pursuit of the Jews, but now he's relentless in preaching Christ, and we see that the Jews are seeking the death of Paul, and they are relentless and relentless in that effort. Uh, Paul would later tell them a church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 11:32. At Damascus, and that's what that's where we are here with Paul in Acts chapter nine. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas 
was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. So they were seeking out Paul to seize him and kill him. But he also knew that he, he at one time was doing the same thing. Now, full commitment. Prior to becoming a Christian, Paul was fully committed. He said he didn't violate his conscience. His conscience was just misguided. How do we have the right kind of conscience? We let our conscience be guided by the truth that we learn from the Bible, and then we can't go wrong. But, you know, somewhere in the Bible it says it's not within man that, let, uh, that walketh to guide his own steps. We need the Word of God to do that. And Paul now is fully committed to teaching Christ. And then Luke 9, 23 and 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So I broke it down. And we need to do this daily, not just on the Lord's Day or for Bible class, but every day. Deny self. What's the name of that song? Uh, that transition, I kind of refer to it as a tra transition song. Uh, more, less of self and more of thee. I don't know if that's the name of it, but y'all remember the song? Yeah. And it starts off, and each verse, uh, the writer, when we sing the song, we're getting closer and closer to God. So we deny self daily, grow in Christ, as we read in 3 John verse 2, take up our cross daily, and then follow me. Who is the me in this verse? Jesus this Christ. And follow me. Comments, anyone? Yeah, I think you're right that it takes a daily commitment to deny yourself. <clears throat> you just it's not something you can think about every now and then you have to constantly yeah that's right they commit and you know the more you practice that lifestyle the better it gets the better it gets because you start just kind of uh, automatically may not be the word but you're just more determined to walk the right way and not go the way of the world. You're more determined when you're around someone that doesn't know Christ to think, well, I do want them to know that I'm a Christian. I, you know, I don't mean you walk up in their face and, and uh, you know, in a, in a bad way, proclaim Christ, but live it in a way to where maybe you can stir some interest and influence others. So you, you live that daily. Any other comments about this daily walk with Christ? Verse 27. We're about to run out of time, and I don't want to miss verse 27. When I read through Acts, Barnabas is such an influential person. And he's not always the primary speaker. You know, he's not always at the forefront. The point being, you don't have to be. Barnabas first comes on the scene back in Acts 4, 36 and 37. Acts 4, 36. But Joseph, his name was Joseph, who was also uh, called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levi, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas was an encourager. I'm rushing a little because we're about to run out of time. Uh, Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now think about, uh, now I'm thinking ahead here a little, but didn't Barnabas stick with Paul and tell the brethren, yeah, you can trust this guy. He, he's sound. He's okay. He's no longer a persecutor. But Barnabas stuck with John Mark also. Later in Acts, when Paul says, no, I don't want to take John Mark. He didn't stick with us before, you know. So they had a dispute. This wasn't over doctrine. It was over matters of opinion. Barnabas had one view. Paul had a different. They went on two different routes. Uh, Barnabas took John Mark. Paul took Silas. And the gospel was, was proclaimed. So when you have a dispute, 
with a brother or sister in Christ, and it's not over doctrinal matters. You know, you just learn to come to a, an agreement somehow. But Barnabas stuck with Paul, and he stuck with John Mark also. He was a, an encourager, encourager, devoted to Christ. Any comments? I really do appreciate the comments. Uh, I kind of, I'm one of those that feeds off of those. It just, uh, uh, well, it's encouraging. When I get the comments, I guess I look at it as people trying to be or being like Barnabas. We encourage one another, and that's why we gather and study so that we can deny ourselves, take up our cross every day, and then follow Christ. Thank you. Appreciate it.